um, some of you guys are going to recognize some of uh, the topics that I'm going to discuss here because, as I was telling Dr. Oro during the lunch break, um, I think we've been sort of living on like parallel universes thinking about these ideas uh, and, how, and how they all connect together underneath one common umbrella, so to speak. Everyone gets this label of having a Chiari and as you've heard from Dr. Oro and from other speakers, it's certainly not always the case. There are lots of other things. And over the past decade, I've started trying to put together how I think about these patients. I was doing it subconsciously for a long time. And then once I finally started meeting with the CSF regularly and, and talking with the other members of the advisory board about how they approach this problem um, and the problem with patients who are labeled as Chiari, who don't get better or who have worsened outcomes after surgery, I sort of put this together. So um, I've given this to the think tank before, one version of this talk, and um, we finally have a um, manuscript in preparation. So hopefully it'll start circulating around to the CSF members so they can take a look at it. So once again, thanks to, for the invitation. I like starting with this slide, even if it's just for two seconds, because it's one of the original descriptions um, of clinical manifestations of QR. There's the original paper on the left, but on the right side, a couple of um, sort of preeminent neurosurgeons from the middle of the century talking about how there's great disagreement at little concurrence on how to approach this problem of Chiari malformation. And so 80 or 90 years later, we haven't really gotten much further. Um, the historical perspective on the confusion here is um, probably not worth going over here, but it's, it is really interesting that even since the very beginning, what was first described as Chiari malformation, and the very reason it bears the name Chiari is because Dr. Hans Chiari diagnosed these patients with ectopia or herniation of their cerebellum. It turns out that none of them actually probably had Chiari, they had hydrocephalus. And so that really goes back to the root of, you know, we've been calling it Chiari and even he got it wrong. So I, I think that this is, this is why I put this up here because it reminds me to say this is, this is really complicated. <coughs> So as Dr. Oro mentioned, we have to figure this out. Chiari presents in lots of different ways, both in kids and adults. I take care of both populations. Um, and understanding this is really the first step towards figuring out how to take care of the patients. Any cookie cutter approach towards this is how I do Chiari surgery is destined for failure when patients present in all different types of flavors. And so this is my own algorithm that I'm gonna to present to you here. And what they all share is cerebellar medullary compression. They all have compression They've all got the funnel that Dr. Oro showed. They've all got something going on at either the medulla or the cerebellum or the cervical medullary junction that is producing the symptoms that has brought you to the office. And whether they come labeled with Chiari or not, this is what they've got. And so I'm gonna share this with you guys for discussion uh, and obviously for sharing so that we can um, get these thoughts out there and um, have more physicians aware of the complexity of the situation. So. This is a frustrating patient population, no question. I don't need to tell the patients who are in this room the reason you're here is because it's frustrating, um, but we've got to get together and figure this out. So you're in the right room if you've heard this. You don't really have Chiari. Your herniation is too small to cause symptoms. Your syrinx isn't causing any pain. I wouldn't even see a surgeon. They just like to operate. I get that one a lot. You have something called Chiari, but it usually doesn't cause symptoms. That's a classic ER discharge paperwork. I was told 10 years ago I had QR, they told me not to worry about it kind of thing. Got migraines, you've had surgery, there's nothing more I can do. This is Dr. Oro's practice, right? <laughs> the revision surgery is, you know, a big part of what we do, you need to lose weight. Those are just things I thought about, you know, last night when I was thinking about, um, you know, why this is such an pertinent topic and conversation for patients who are coming to these meetings. So, the classifications that we currently use are not really all that relevant to making decisions for surgery. The radiographic criteria is kind of meaningless, and I'm not going to go through these, but just give you the ideas of how we think about this, you know, in a historical sense. Symptomatic, you know, you've got the wrong type of headache, you don't really fit the pattern for Chiari, it's probably not a Chiari thing. This idea of, you know, how do you look at an MRI scan and say, well, you've got a syrinx, you probably should have surgery, but what if it's asymptomatic? What if you've had it for 10 years? So the predictive models are hard. And so what I like to do the best, and it's obviously a combination of all these things, is really try to think about the pathophysiology, which is a combination of underlying neurologic symptoms within the context of the clues that the MRIs and CTs are giving you. And that allows you to dictate that individualized plan. So um, 
as the number of you know, patients I've seen has gone up and the number of surgeries I've done have gone up, I'm actually treating less patients with Chiari surgery. So it's kind of a conundrum. I think I've recognized more and more patients who don't actually need to have Chiari decompression surgery as I've seen more patients who are labeled with Chiari. Um, so just one out of every five patients who think they're coming to me for surgery end up there at some point over you know, the ensuing number of years. So here's a traditional scheme that we use zero to, five, to four with all these sort of subclassifications, and I introduced Chiari 0 0.5 at the last think tank. So there's all these things that you can look at radiographically that are really minutia that don't really mean a whole lot in terms of how you approach the patients. Most patients sort of fall into that one or 1 1.5, and so is this really relevant to use given the population of patients that we're treating, and is this useful for us to make decisions? Again, treatment variability is, is so wide. Um, we've heard again this morning there's so many different um, forks in the road in, ter in terms of how we each go about performing our surgery. Um, and, you know, we can go through those at nauseam, and Dr. R beautifully illustrated a few of those. But um, I think you do have to come up with a tailored approach to each patient. And you can't say, I do it this way or I do it that way. And some of the limitations for what we're, you know, going to see are the results of the, the dural versus dural sparing operation trial from PCORI is that even within those two arms, there are dozens of different branch points and differences in how patients are operated on by different surgeons with respect to opening up the obex, opening up the arachnoid, doing a cranioplasty. So um, I'm optimistic that it'll be a huge step forward for us in terms of outcomes, but uh, I think, um, un unfortunately, there's still gonna be a lot of variability in how patients are treated, even at the end of that long study. And how we judge success is, is, a, is a tricky one also. So here's a scan that shows you know, a great success based upon the MRI scan, resolution of space behind the tonsils and uh, collapsed syrinx. Um, but what if the patient didn't get any better, right? What if the patient still has that same neck pain or they still have back pain or numbness in their hands? Is that a success? And so how neurosurgeons have traditionally judged success may be very different from the way patients judge success. So this is, this is um, a real brief introduction to this classification scheme for cervical medullary compression syndrome that I've come up with that I think is an easy way, and I use it in my office, and I teach it to my nurses and my PAs, and um, it's the way that I try to silo patients into different categories. And I apologize for the small font there, but basically I've tried to be kitschy here, and I've used Chiari as an acronym essentially for um, compressive, hydrodynamic, iatrogenic, acquired, retroflexodontoid and instability of the craniocervical junction. So each one of those letters stands for a group of patients, and each group of those patients has a different type of presentation. In my experience, they require different workup in terms of the imaging studies and other tests and other comorbid conditions that I might consider evaluating them for, um, and obviously a different treatment algorithm. So no, not every patient that comes to you needs to have a flexion and extension or a genetics workup or a CT scan, but various populations need to have different parts of that workup, uh, otherwise things can get missed. So the, the second part of my talk, we'll just be going through those silos real briefly, give a quick example on each of those, um, and in that limited time, hopefully you'll get a flavor for how everything that's all called Chiari on these slides um, looks and smells very differently once you sort of boil it down to what the pathophysiology is here. So this is a classic compressive pathophysiology, which I think is maybe the easiest to think of uh, technically, right? This is just that you know, blockage, that's the funnel that you heard about this morning right at the cervical medullary junction there. Um, and this is, the, this is the physiology. They're being blocked either um, by um, bone, dura, or combination. It's congenital um, in, in nature. And these patients undergo standard decompressions in my hands. And, um, are one of the small groups of patients where I might consider dural sparing operations. For patients who come in with just pure occipital headaches, um, who are having that, that typical stabbing pain with tussle of events, but aren't having a whole lot of other neurology that makes me suspicious for medullary compression or cerebellar compression that's really symptomatic, um, I, I'll, I'll consider doing dural sparing. And these are often little kids, you know, the two-year-olds or three-year-olds who are holding their head or banging their head or teenagers who have pure occipital headaches, and, and they do extremely well. But uh, I'm not a big fan of that operation in general, but this is a population that I, I think is warranted in. Here's an example of a teenage girl who has really impressive herniation, actually. So um, tonsillar herniation almost all the way down to C2, just had occipital and neck pain, um, and that was really it. I mean, I did sleep studies, I did EMGs, everything was completely negative. 
And the family actually was a Jehovah's Witness believing, and so I wasn't all that excited about doing a brain operation on them anyway. And so we discussed Daryl Sparing as part of the sort of algorithm that I was developing. And it turns out she's now three years out from um, that operation, and I see her every year, and she's got absolutely no headaches. So, you know, there's a population here where this works. We know that there's a population that is um, bound to have failure at this and will come back for multiple operations with uh, duroplasty, but this is a group where I feel sometimes it's worth considering um, being less invasive. The hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic pathophysiology is what Dr. Heiss was just talking about. These are the patients who do have a derangement in CSF flow, whether it's hydrocephalus, syringomyelia. Um, there's something that has um, been secondarily caused by compression of the cervical medullary junction that's resulted in this pathology. And this is where things like CINE MRI scans and you know getting a really good assessment of whether or not they've got raised intracranial pressure with uh, dilated ophthalmologic exams. These are patients where I'll put ICP monitors in to um, really convince myself that there, there's not a pressure dynamic going on because one of the strongest um, tenets I have in my practice is that I always treat the hydrodynamic ICP related problems before touching the Chiari. So if there's any equipoise in my mind that there are two things going on, I always try to lean towards fixing the underlying pathophysiology unless I think it's purely a result of obstruction from the Chiari. So these are cool patients because sometimes you can, um, you know, affect impressive changes here, as you've seen. So a couple of examples. Here's a 23-year-old with the classic syrinx that Dr. Heist just showed. Here's a 38-year-old. Um, they look pretty similar, right, if you look at the syrinx uh, on the outward. Um, so for number one, standard posterior fossa decompression with duroplasty, that's what PFDD is. Um, the second one, turns out that once we got old films from this gentleman, um, he had a shunt that he forgot to tell us about. <laughs> and he had massive hydrocephalus. So we fixed his shunt and his syrinx went away within a couple of months and he was back to normal. So the underlying hydrodynamics in, this, in the intracranial compartment is really, really the driving force um, for that patient in terms of the syrinx and the spinal cord, which was, which was quite dramatic. Um, so you had to really think about that. And here's a cute case of a 16-year-old female with um, what looks like a really terrible Chiari and um, basic, you know, kink at the cervical marriage junction. This is probably a Chiari 1.5. Um, she had a shunt as an infant, um, and instead of doing Chiari surgery, we explored the shunt. It wasn't working and decided to do an ETV. And even though that MRI scan still looks pretty terrible in terms of the cervical medullary junction postoperatively, she's completely symptom-free now. So restoring the proper hydrodynamic uh, flow within the intracranial compartment resolved whatever it was that was causing the symptomatology of the cervical medullary junction. Just changing that pressure gradient by a little bit was, was enough for her. And we've treated about six or seven patients with uh, Chiari type herniation with ETVs um, in really select cases. Um, and it's, it's obviously extremely rewarding given the minimally invasive nature of what an ETV is. And for those of you who don't know, it's just an endoscopic procedure in the ventricle that restores cerebral spinal fluid flow. There's some pictures on the right there that kind of show what it looks like. Iatrogenic pathophysiology, I can almost skip this because I feel like Dr. Oral lifted these slides for me. These are, these, are the, these are the exact patients that he described this morning. And I, you know, I have a couple of you know, uh, uh, similar pictures to him. I get three DCT reconstructions like he showed. I really work hard to rule out IIH and, and CSF leaks in these patients because they're, they're failing for a reason, um, and often for multiple reasons. The most common thing that I see is if someone comes in after a, a posterior fossa decompression surgery and they've got a CSF leak, um, I always think first about um, IIH. I mean, I feel like Maybe it's the you know the optimist in me, but I feel like most of my colleagues are pretty darn good surgeons, and you know I feel like that's a really common thing to miss is just the underlying etiology. And if they've missed IIH, and they've done a decompression and opened up the dura, well, they're just setting themselves up for failure with the CSF leak. So um, I work really hard when I first see these redo patients to, to rule out those etiologies, and sometimes it's painful. It can take months to really work down this whole list here of things that you need to do, but it's really important. Here are some examples of these patients who come in with all kinds of crazy pathophysiology. On the top there, you see a patient who's got this just enormous rent in her dura. Turns out that I went, when I read the operative report from, what is this, 1990, they just didn't close the dura. It was just a different era. They just widely splayed it open and put down some muscle, and what you get is a, a spinal cord and brainstem that scars 
to the opening. You can see that on the top right there. Let me see if I can use my this work here. Nope. Oh well. How about that? There you go. So right there. Thank you. Who's doing that? <laughs> the scarring on the dura um, on the left there. Uh, and, a, and a very similar one. So here's, this is the patient that Dr. Oro stole from me, a huge uh, decompression, um, who actually had a massive decompression, but was actually still constricted at the foramen of magnum. So they think they did an enormous decompression, and in fact they took everything except what they really needed to take, which is right at the constriction point. And so, um, this, you know, we, we look like heroes here. It was a really s simple reoperation to do this, um, but they needed to be done. Sometimes you get these really small decompressions here. Again, this is you know, obviously woefully inadequate in terms of um, decompressing the posterior fossa and it needs to be redone. Um, and sometimes you just need to fix the really obvious things that other surgeons just are blind to or just don't want to deal with um, as a postoperative complication. So a clear dural dehiscence or an inadequate decompression. And those are iatrogenic. Those are things that we caused as a community, the, the global we. Acquired is the, the, the patient population that has an underlying etiology that doesn't really mean Chiari, right? They've got either idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which was called pseudotumor for many years, or they've got CSF leaks. And these are really cool patients when you figure out what the problem is. The problem is it's really hard to do this sometimes. And you know, here's an example of a patient where they had really classic positional headaches, right? They couldn't stand up. They were laying down all the time, and as soon as they sat up for more than five minutes, they got terrible headaches, and they thought they had a Chiari, and I put a pressure monitor in after MRI scans were negative. It turns out they just had negative you know, intracranial pressure, so they had a CSF leak that a myelogram detected, and um, a thoracic leak was repaired. So that's obviously very rewarding. Not only do you find the real underlying cause, you fix it in a real meaningful way, and you prevent them from having complications from the posterior fossa decompression, which in that case would have made her dramatically worse because you just would have created a larger area through which the herniation could be pushed down or pulled down in that circumstance by, um, by the CSF leak. Um, so you've heard about um, IIH enough times. Here's a patient who came in to me for a Chiari, never had her spine imaged. Turns out she's got this big lipomyelomeningocele that's basically just been pulling down her um, cervical spine, posterior fossa, to the point where it looked like she had a minimal Chiari. Um, turns out once I examined her and talked to her, none of her symptoms were really Chiari related. They were all uh, low back uh, related. She had clonus and she had back pain and uh, did a very successful surgery for a lipomyelomeningocele repair, which is essentially a complex form of tethered cord. And then in patients who have um, IIH, we look very um, routinely now at uh, magnetic resonance venograms, which are essentially scans that look at the drainage, the large veins that drain the brain are called sinuses, and there seems to be a very, very high correlation between stenosis and um, some of the large veins that drain the brain of their blood um, and pseudotumor cerebri, or IIH, and so um, a bunch of interventional neuroradiologists now are becoming proficient at putting stents into these veins, including at Cornell, where I work, and so any time I see someone with IIH and they've failed medical therapy, I try to get them into venous stenting. I think it's a lot less morbid than uh, shunting is overall, but um, a lot less um, robust in terms of the long-term clinical follow-up. But understanding the pathophysiology and actually finding the problem that's causing the pseudotumor uh, is very rewarding and nice that we're actually getting there. The last two categories are um, Pretty complicated, and I think you're going to hear um, some great talks by Dr. Henderson later on what's going on at the craniocervical junction in terms of the actual mechanical st uh, structures and forces that are imparted in patients who either have hypermobility type syndromes um, or congenital problems of the skull base. And I've been seeing more and more patients who have these problems, and they fit in really nicely into this algorithm and based on the fact that they do have cervical medullary compression. It's just due to a secondary type of etiology. And so there are patients who either have retroflexion of the odontoid, which is the front of the front and top of the spinal column pushing into their brainstem, medullary compression on the ventral side, or they have got no herniation um, and they just have instability of the craniocervical junction from EDS or, or other hypermobility syndromes. Um, and the constant flexion and extension of their neck in a hypermobile way produces these unnatural stresses and strains on the brainstem, um, causing the same type of symptoms in the absence of a real Chiari. And so these are complicated 
patients. Um, we often need to do really um, specific testing looking at the brain stem. On the left there, you can see um, this is a swallow study showing the, the dye um, within the um, bolus that the patient swallowed ending up in the lungs, uh, indicating that they've got lower cranial nerve dysfunction and dysphagia from lack of apposition of the vocal cords. I get lots of sleep studies on patients to try and figure out if there's a real cause for the sleep apnea related to the brainstem, trying to distinguish between central uh, and obstructive sleep apnea can sometimes be difficult, and you can have both or either from uh, Chiari malformation or brainstem compression, but I find these really helpful to try and at least hone in on the fact that we've got objective data um, that is pointing us in the right direction. And sometimes you don't need that data. Sometimes you've got a scan that looks like this, and you know these, <clears throat> these are the patients that really drew me into the field initially when I started getting interested in Chiari and cervical medullary junction type anomalies. He's a 14-month-old who had clear sleep apnea, was aspirating, couldn't walk straight. So this, this, this kid didn't need a whole lot of tests, but it was, it was very clear that there was abnormalities there. Um, and for these patients who have a retroflex odontoid, um, the algorithm is a little bit more complicated and probably beyond going into today, but often they'll need um, stabilization of the posterior fossa with the upper cervical spine, so an OC fusion. But in certain pop uh, patients, they actually also need the odontoid resected because the odontoid, even in a uh, reduced and uh, fixed position, can still be causing compression on the brainstem. Not all of them. I think it's a minority, but certain patients do need both. And this is a patient who had posterior fossa decompression, so you can see the, the cerebellar space has been recreated. They've got the fusion you can see on the x-ray, but they also had an endoscopic endonasal approach to the odontoid. A really, uh, actually pretty minimally invasive and, and easy operation to do if you've been trained endoscopically. Um, and that ventral compression has been relieved. You can see the brainstem went from basically being kinked and, and smashed to um, re-expanding and, and having an ICSF around it. So pretty big series of operations, a lot of coordination, a lot of testing and planning goes into something like this. Um, but it can be remarkable in terms of the results you can get. And um, sometimes, obviously, even with occipital cervical fusion, the odontoid is still causing problems. And here's just a, a really extreme example of a woman I took care of who had been fused for a long time. She had rheumatoid arthritis, and that didn't prevent uh, the odontoid from essentially uh, migrating up and, and invaginating into her brainstem. And nothing you can do with this except remove the odontoid. And so we're able to do that endoscopically. And, get a really nice result just by going straight through the nasal cavities and, and drilling that out and decompressing the brainstem from the front. So totally different type of pathophysiology, but really it's cervical medullary compression, and that's the unifying feature that all these patients have. And then the last, um, the most complicated perhaps, unfortunately for some of you in this room, and the hardest to figure out are those patients who have instability of the craniocervical junction and um, trying to figure out how to best identify patients who really have this etiology how to test for it preoperatively, how to predict who's going to do well from craniocervical fusion. I think there, these are still um, areas that I feel um, unsatisfied that I have the right answers for. Um, but certainly doing dynamic imaging, collar trials, genetic evaluations, thinking about all the underlying associated uh, anomalies that go with um, EDS, um, dysautonomia, mast cell activation. These, these things are, are tricky, um, and I don't certainly um, a spouse that I have the answers to it, but I think that working through them and thinking about them as their own category is really helpful because CAR decompression is not the answer for these patients. It's really a question of whether or not they've got hypermobility at that joint and are causing excessive strain on the craniocervical junction. So here's an example. You can just see looking at the scans that this is a hypermobile patient. They can bend all the way forward and all the way back without any difficulty. And on their flexion extension uh, MRI scans, you can see that the, the brainstem is being impinged ventrally. And so putting them in a collar really helps a lot. If they have a positive collar response, they'll take them out of the collar and make their symptoms come back and make them go back in the collar. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a quite an ordeal, but these patients um, have a lot of complications and a, a high risk of surgery. So I have to feel like there's a real strong patient physician contract going into these surgeries that we're doing everything that we can to make sure that they're going to have an optimal outcome. And even with all of that, some of them don't do well and have complications like wound breakdown, healing problems, problems fusing their constructs. So this is a, this is a patient population that you have to be really cautious with but can have amazing results. Um, and so this is a patient who did, obviously, we always show good results, but certainly the um, um, I've had my share of patients who did not have um, optimal results and um, have either had either partial results or a couple of patients where they didn't get better despite every indication that they would based on the pre-op planning. So tough, tough population. And as I always end with, these groups are not mutually exclusive. I think about them in silos to help my 
own kind of work up become a little bit more regimented and, and help me define what I'm thinking about here. But here's a patient who kind of went through the whole algorithm and went from this really quite terrible looking herniation to a nice decompression, but then worsened um, compression ventrally, uh, eventually a fusion. And so scan looks great, still dealing with other problems related to underlying issues like dysautonomia and, and hypermobility. But um, these categories can overlap uh, quite a bit. So think about this when you're seeing your patients or if your patient's in the room and you're seeing your physician. Try to think about how you classify yourself. Make sure your doctor understands how these groups may interact with one another. Compressive, hydrodynamic, iatrogenic, acquired, retroflexodontite, or instability. These are, these are flexible, they are interchangeable. This is just my mnemonic because it makes it easy for me to remember them. But I think you know whatever you use as a way of identifying an algorithm, it's important that you sort of say structured because this, this is obviously a complicated patient population. So just remember this is not one disease. It's a very complex constellation of both congenital and acquired pathophysiology put together. Always think about the symptoms over the measurements. All the associated disorders really need to be sorted out and, and investigated fully before considering surgery. And define first on the spectrum where someone exists so you can individualize and re-examine that continually. Seek out expertise, be an advocate for yourself and for others, for your family members, uh, for patients in your community. Um, and look for people who have an expertise in this or are interested in this. There are um, a lot of people around the country who are passionate about this, and I think that um, you shouldn't settle for anyone who doesn't completely understand how complex this disease is. So um, thanks for inviting me, and uh, hopefully you have a great rest of your day and a great day tomorrow on the Hill. Thank you.